Now, when I was at Nortel and I finished my doctorate, I got a call from the Senior Vice President of Employee and Organizational Learning and said, I read your dissertation. I think it's wonderful. I'd like you to come and make it happen at Nortel. I said, wow, that's really cool. So I trotted on over to Nortel, and um, we tootled on up to, uh, where was it, Toronto, to the new, Nortel is now in bankruptcy, you know, how, 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 how things change, but the new facility in Brampton and met, went to meet the CEO, and I'm, I'm just so super excited. And we walk in, and, and, and the senior VP of learning at Nortel at the time was very good friends with, with uh, John Roth, who was the CEO. And so we're going in, and I'm, I'm just so fired up and so excited. And we sit down, and we're going to talk about all our plans to change the world and all this good stuff. And uh, he goes, you know, I'm thinking of abolishing training. <laughs> I've been looking at the numbers, and I'm thinking, you know, I could buy a whole bunch of Wall Street Journal ads for that. I could pick up another company. There, uh, I could invest in some new technologies. And I'm having a really hard time understanding, you know, what value you bring. I'm looking at the guy. What's going on? I mean, you just hired me to change the world in learning. But the truth is, candidly, that executives, whether they're running a bread factory or a, or a printer fab or whatever it is, if there was a magic pill that anybody could take where the new performer acted like the best performer, they'd buy the pill. We are a necessary evil in their eyes. I do mean that. There is a corporate schoolhouse mentality that says learning is good and I'll pay for it. But if there was an alternative that came out, that's the point I'm trying to make. If there was an alternative that speeded up time to performance, that was not what we do, enterprise people would take it. Why? Because they have a fiduciary responsibility to the shareholder to be good stewards of the money. And if it's kind of like, take a tablet and do that, which we all laugh at today, but I'm going to make some claims that we might be moving faster towards science fiction than we think, this is something we really need to take, take account for take account of. And what I believe the companies here, uh, here in the New York, but from Ireland are doing, is really taking a good look at the landscape of what's going on in learning and how learning is happening organically out there, and then what we can do to continue to bring the value of what we understand about how people learn and, ha and, and all of those things we learned, but to do it in a fundamentally different way. Okay? The fundamental problem is the fact that my mother smokes. I had a slide with a, fa a Facebook picture of my mom. My mom has gone absolutely berserk on Facebook. She found out about it you know, seven weeks ago. She's been on it 24 hours straight. She's putting up very embarrassing pictures of me when I was young. I've had to issue a cease and desist moment, right? Uh, and and here, my mom is, she's the greatest woman in the world, but she's like, these things are gonna kill me. This is our fundamental disconnect, right? The knowing-doing gap, Jeff Pfeffer's written extensively about this. Uh, there's even a book called The Knowing-Doing Gap that he wrote with Bob Sutton at Stanford. And it's like, how do we bridge this gap? And it's not a small gap, it's a big chasm. You know? And how comfortable do we feel making that jump? Would you all make that jump right now if, if we were at the top of, of the knowing curve and going to the doing? So how do we go from knowing to doing seamlessly? And then even further, how, we, how do we go from doing to differentiating, which is getting to, to that last you know mile where people can really, really make a difference. That's the fundamental problem I've been studying for quite some time. And what I've found is there's seven scary problems. Most of my presentations, by the way, they go like uh, the Gartner hype cycle. My goal is to get you so depressed and bring you <laughs> way into the trough of disillusionment that you want to jump off the 40th floor of, of this building and then pull you back out and say there's hope, you know, a little Obama touch towards the end. <laughs> Uh, but but let, me, let me talk pretty candidly about the seven problems. The first problem is what I call the autonomous learner problem, which means we have, increased, we have increased competition because if you walked out the hall today and you asked people, where did you learn the most to be effective in your job? One out of ten, if you're lucky, will say in the classroom. It was, and we know this, right? The problem is that learning happens everywhere and we don't have jurisdiction over it. And furthermore, we absolve ourselves largely of responsibility for informal learning, and I'll be talking about this in much more detail, by calling it informal and saying, homie, don't do that. We do formal learning. We do learning objectives. Well, if the majority of the learning is happening outside of the formal context, and we are leaving it to chance, we're leaving a lot of money on the table from a business perspective. That's another thing I would encourage you to think about. Timing. There's a timing problem. If you look at the training production process. From the moment somebody has an aha out at the edge of the enterprise to where it gets absorbed back into the middle of the enterprise to where we figure out if it's going to be e-learning or not learning, if we're going to have formal or not, if we're going to have donuts at the thing, if we're going to have it on the 40th floor here, or if we're going to do it in e-learning, and then we codify it and we send it back out. 
Estimates are 18 months. So we're training old habits by definition because the world's kind of flipped two or three times by the time we get that production process out. So we have a timing problem. Next one we have, we have a packaging problem. The packaging problem is called the course. Latest statistics, and, and uh, Al can probably give us some more, but let's, let's be generous. Let's say two-thirds of the time people drop out of e-learning. Why? One minute. Why two-thirds? Why do people drop out? Just work at your tables for one minute. I want to see what the top, you know, what are the top reasons, okay? Why do people drop out? This is not necessarily, AD, ADD people, to Johnny's point, will drop out because it's like, I can't pay attention. So they got what they needed and they got out. That's, that's actually one of the top answers. Now, the issue with that is, how do you all get paid? How do you all secure budget? Course completion. Hmm, little disconnect between the market, right, and how you justify your existence within the governance system of the enterprise, right? So it's like, oh, no, no, please stay and complete the course. <laughs> I got to go. I got to sell in Idaho tomorrow, and, you know, on page three of chapter one of the 17-chapter uh, LMS, or I'm sorry, uh, e-learning module, I got what I needed. I'm out of here. So there's a packaging problem. Any others? Interruptions, so it's hard to kind of be locked in and paying attention to this thing. Any others? Yeah, getting what I need and getting out is probably, probably one of the biggest ones. Or it's boring. I don't like doing the page turning. Yeah, it... Right, so this is a big issue. When we go from, you know, classroom to E, it's like, you, you, ha you miss the X factor of a really good facilitator who can kind of read between the lines. How many of us actually execute the course plan or the lesson plan to the letter? For the record, nobody raised their hands, right? I mean, <laughs> because there's this thing that you bring, and that thing kind of dies in, an e in, a, in a current e-page turning context, and oh, there's that word. You lose context. So I believe new instructional design practices are going to have to take a lot more um, heed, and I think we can learn a lot from our colleagues in gaming who use the magic circle as a, as a mechanism for motivation to bring context to the situation and engineer teachable moments so that the, you establish motivation. The thing, that, the thing that leaves when you put things in, the, in an e-form, in a dry page turning e-form, is establishing motivation. I've tried to establish, I'm trying to establish motivation by scaring the you-know-what out of you right now so that then hopefully when we get further into the presentation, you're more willing to listen to some of the wacky stuff I'm about to say. Uh, this may not come across as well in a media format where I'm not here, okay? The next one's performance. The, the, this is just basic human performance technology 101, but if you look at any performance problem, sales are down, the assembly line's not kicking out as much stuff, or the baggage is getting lost in the Atlanta airport. I did a lot of research with, with Delta Airlines when I was an ASTD fellow. Is that how much of it, this is an, another quiz, how much of any performance problem is due to lack of knowledge on, the, on behalf of the people? Just, just, again, pair up and tell me. I want to know a percentage. What percentage of a given performance problem, we're losing bags, the assembly line's not going at 100%, sales are down, what percentage of that, on average, is due to the fact that the people don't know what they should be doing? I'll give you one minute. Between 10 and 11%. <laughs> what are the other issues? Primary issue? Work, flow, process. Another primary issue? Data. Another primary issue? Intrinsic motivation. Another primary issue? Extrinsic motivation. There's six real, you know, if, if you're into the human forms technology literature, this, this stuff is pretty well documented. 